Ladies and gentlemen of Hashtag Nation, joining me for uh, another edition of our Rapid Fire segment is Jeremy Turner Montgomery and Clayton Garrett of the Cold Front Report, where they say, uh, your team, your voice, your show. Right now, they're your problem, guys. No. <laughs> uh, be sure to give them a follow on Twitter and Facebook as well, uh, as well as their uh, website, coldfrontreport.com, where they have articles and videos all about the Buffalo Bills. Uh, they're guy, guys, they're a great follow. They're a great you know, in, interaction all the time if you guys message them. They're going to get right back to you. Uh, I've had the pleasure of talking to them off camera about the Buffalo Bills, and i got to tell you, these guys are very insightful on everything that they talk about. In the description of the video, you'll see their links to their Twitter as well as their uh, website and everything. But as first things first, as before we even get into that, Jeremy, how you how you doing today, buddy? I'm feeling good, feeling good. Ready to talk some Bills football. Oh, I'm excited too, I'm excited too. Clayton, how you doing this morning, bud? We're doing good, doing good. I'm you were, excited. You weren't welding anything this morning, were you? Oh man, I miss Weldon, man. I can't. I don't. I don't got my own, so it's all done at school or work. I'm excited to get back, but hopefully that's sooner rather than later. Am I right? Awesome. Yes, I do. Um, I'm. I'm going nuts over here. Like I said, we were talking about it before off camera, just a little bit. I feel like I'm. I am legend, dude. I'm just driving. It's driving myself nuts at home all the time. Um, so just to give you guys a little bit of a background on the rapid fire segment, what we do is we poll hashtag nation. We say, listen, what are your questions, uh, uh, for Paul and I, for the, um, uh, for the Buffalo Bills? Well, we kind of decided to take a little bit of a twist since Paul is not here. And, uh, so here's how it's going to work. I give you guys a question that hashtag nation has proposed. Uh, now the twist of it is I have to stand on the opposite side of whatever the point is. So whatever you guys decide to say for the point or the question, I have to try to offer a counterpoint. Now, I might make some enemies tonight uh, for this, but we're going to try to see how this goes. So um, don't blame me, guys. Hashtag Nation if, if I have enough. <laughs> oh, yeah. Beasley's going to get traded. Like, what, what's wrong with you? You know, what's going on? So uh, <laughs> right out of the gate, let's, uh, let's, let's just take it off. Uh, let me see. Pierre Martinez comes in. He says, between Dawkins, Milano, White, and Hyde. Whose quote unquote uh, parentheses potential replacement could we be drafting in 2020 and which round? So let me kick this to Jeremy and then over to Clayton. Uh, I'm gonna go with Milano, and Ooh. the reason I say that is because you're gonna end up paying Tremaine Edmonds in a couple of years. You're gonna end up paying Ed Oliver. I don't know what Milano's gonna command as far as salary wise, but outside linebackers are replaceable. I saw the Bears go through this with Lance Briggs years ago and Brian Erlacher. They eventually finally played Briggs and they never won a thing. So I'm going to go with Milano. Oh. Clayton, who do you got, buddy? I mean, you look at a player like Kyle Duggar. I wouldn't be shocked if he was the second round pick at 54 this year. So I'm going to say potentially uh, Micah Hyde. Similar, I, I can see why Milano is a good point because you're looking at almost, almost $13 million per year because you look at Shaq Thompson's extension. That's a pretty penny when you're going to be paying top dollar for Tremaine Edmonds in a few years, like JT had mentioned. But Micah Hyde is entering his age 30 season. You got both safeties starting to age a little bit. You need to get some depth behind him that you can rely upon in a couple of years. So does that mean that they're since John Brown is already 30, they're going to draft the wide receiver this year? I'm I believe just, so, yeah. I'm going off the question. I'm just curious. I, I believe so, yeah. That, that's a firm belief of mine. <laughs> I believe uh, wide receiver is a, a very good option at 54 if players like LaVisca and all fall down there to him. Yeah, it's. It, I mean, it's it's interesting to see that. Uh, okay, between Dawkins, so you guys, so Jeremy picked Milano, uh, you picked Hyde. So I got to pick between Dawkins and White. I'm not. I'm not touching Trey White because I mean, I'm pretty sure that uh, I'm pretty sure that McDermott learned his lesson down in Carolina that when they let Josh Norman go, I mean, it was a dumpster fire on the back end there. So uh, I think he's going to try to seal up White as fast as possible. I'm going to say Dawkins. Uh, I see a lot of offensive line talent falling down in the draft. I mean, I know this, it's not the sexy pick at 54 to take an offensive tackle. However, if, if I have to give a counterpoint to you guys, I'm going to say, you know, drafting an offensive tackle, you've already signed guys. you got a bunch of guys that you threw together last year. It'd be so interesting to see if they did, in fact, take a tackle at 54, if that's where they stay, first of all. But uh, I, I'd be interested to see what happens and what manifests from there to see – who they're going to take. I mean, I, I know a lot of people in Buffalo would be upset if they took an offensive tackle, but the talent at the skill positions that's going to push tackles down, I think it's going to be uh, – Bean's always about pulling the trigger for best player available. So uh, that could be where, one of the options they go. 
All right, truth to hearts. He said, do you agree that this year Josh Allen has the most pressure out of all quarterbacks that, that played in uh, for the Bills in the recent past? Also, two-part question. Uh, also, do you think that it's fair that the expectation is so high? His expectations on the level uh, – the level of the Cowboys last year and the Browns, you know, teams that win the offseason, the expectation of those teams, um, we saw how that turned out. So let me start with Clayton, and then I'll go over to Jeremy. Well, you talk about years past. I don't think there's any quarterback of recent memory that ever had these kind of expectations that were drafted by the Bills. I mean, you look at a player like E.J. Manuel, the most recent first-round co- drafted quarterback by the Bills, like since other than Josh Allen. We never had any kind of expectations for him going to year three. Going into year three is a three-way battle going out of camp, not where you're the guy and this is the year that you have to prove it. And, yes, I do believe that these expectations and the pressure is fair because this is the kind of thing that you have to deal with as a young quarterback in order to prove yourself to be a known commodity in the National Football League. Uh, You know what? I'm going to disagree. I don't think he has to. I don't think he has the most pressure of quarterback pass. Actually, I have a name that I think had more pressure was Rob Johnson when we traded our first round ninth pick for him from Jacksonville. And nothing against Josh. I, I just think like the pressure on Buffalo, it's a lot of Bills fans don't like fail to criticize Josh Allen. They don't want to. They think he's building. And I mean, I'm one of those guys. I I, I see that he's building up to be something really good, but. I think that more pressure is going to be placed on Brandon McDean and Sean McDermott and Brian Dable. Now, the biggest pressure is going to be on Brian Dable to push aside from Josh Allen by most fans. So, no, I don't think so. And on the national stage, I don't think he has the most pressures of, of the young quarterbacks on the national stage either. I think Lamar Jackson is number one because he comes off the MVP season, and I think Baker Mayfield's too because he can't seem to shut his mouth. <laughs> Baker always gets himself in trouble. It's amazing. Uh, I um... – you know, I, I feel that, that Josh Allen does have a lot of pressure on him just just because of the community atmosphere that is in Buffalo. I think a lot of people, um, every, you go 10-6 and six after being starved for making the playoffs for 17 years. I mean, the, the Buffalo Bills, Tyra Taylor, the Buffalo Bills broke the drought um, a couple of years ago. And then Josh Allen, they end up going back to the playoffs going 10-6. and six. The, the expectations with all the new toys that you have on this team are so high for him. Uh, I would say in recent history, yes, that's the most pressure that has ever been put on a Buffalo Bills quarterback. However, um, I agree with Jeremy in the, in the respect that I, I see a lot of holes in Allen's game that he needs to fix and he needs to and, – and, and people don't like when you're critical of Josh Allen. I understand that as well. I mean, we've suffered <laughs> – we suffered it many times here on Hashtag Sports when I try to I try to break Allen down and then I get 15 comments in the in the, in the – comment section that are like oh my god mario what are you talking about but um i completely understand that that perspective of it i think it's it's going to be where people don't have to argue is 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 everything burning is are we are we okay like if alan once again next year if he starts the first five games of the year he doesn't throw for 300 yards don't worry about it i mean that's not how this team is built that's not how sean mcdermott uh, Leslie Frazier, Brian Day will want to build this team. What they want to do is they want to be a ball control team. They want to k- kill you with their defense, and that's how they're going to try to run it. If if there's an opportunity where he'll have to throw for 300, it means because the Bills are losing and they're down and he has to throw. Like I, I just don't understand how that narrative gets lost in the mix with, with Josh Allen and his statistics. So, um, you know, from my vantage point, I think he's going to have a lot of a lot of pressure on him just just for the sheer fact is Tom Brady left the division. It's a wide open division now. Everyone talks about it. it's so wide open. So um, everyone, yeah. But it was funny how Brandon Bean said, you know, why does everyone think the Patriots are dead? I don't understand that at all. I think you know Senator Palpatine up there. He knows how to run a team. He knows how to generate wins, and he knows how to win against young, inexperienced quarterbacks. Josh Allen, as much as you guys might love him, he still young and inexperienced Sam Darnold was seeing ghosts last year and Miami's going to have a rookie. So it, it, that's, that's where Belichick thrives against young quarterbacks. So I, I don't, I don't count the Patriots out for one second, you know, in this division, I know I'm getting off topic, but um, I'm just talking about the expectations of Allen. So, I mean, you guys, I mean, continuing on with this question, you guys agree with that? I mean, you guys think that he's, I know Jeremy, you said, you said he's not going to have the most pressure on him, but People are handing the division to the Bills now. Right, they are. They are. But I, I, I feel like Sean McDermott and Brandon Bean 
for the last couple of years, they found ways to deflect the pressure off of Allen. Mm-hmm. Whereas the Jets is a dumpster fire. They have not <laughs> shed it to, for the, they have not pushed the pressure off Darno or deflected it. And, and the Ravens are going to have to try to do it with Lamar Jackson. And the Browns have not been able to do it with Baker Mayfield. But if you really want to talk about recent history, I think Tyrod Taylor had the most pressure on him when he got the contract, where he was an option hanging over his head like, hey, you play well, you'll get this 90 million. But if you don't, we'll pull it. So I can't see how much how that is any less pressure than the situation that that uh, Allen is in. Yeah, true. Clayton, what do you got to add on that? I mean, I agree with you that we can't overlook the Patriots. I mean, I understand they lost their quarterback that they've had for the last 20 years. But like you touched on is they have Bill Belichick still. You know, they the, the thing that made them lethal and Brandon Bean touched on is they had the greatest coach of all time combined with the greatest quarterback of all time. Now they still have the greatest coach of all time, and that can kill some teams, especially with their defense. I mean, you look at the drafts or the draft capital they have going to this offseason. I believe they have a 13 some odd draft picks. Oh, so yeah. they definitely have the draft capital to restock some of the players they lost on the defensive side of the ball, players like Kyle Van Noy, Jamie Collins. And, you know, that defense is always stout and it has been in recent memory. So, I mean, that that really could be the biggest worry when it comes to New England Patriots, regardless of what they do with their quarterback position. I think, like you touched on, Bill Belichick's going to be able to generate some wins, and they're still going to be competitive this year. Oh, God, I hate it. I don't know. I six, hate... I'm, I'm, I'm calling six and ten, Mario. Six and ten? <laughs> six and ten, I'm calling. Well, I got – I got just to tell you guys a side topic. I got in trouble because I said that the Buffalo Bills are going to win the division this year at nine and seven. Ooh, okay. Because you play both Wests, you play AFC, AFC and NFC yeah. West, that's a gauntlet right there. It's not going to be yeah. like last year where you were playing teams that – only had like three wins in week eight you know what i mean so um i mean we can talk about that later but uh let's let's see let's see what else we have on the rapid fire slate here uh steven campone he says why didn't we use yeldon the way he was supposed to be used um like line him up outside or whatever uh to get him open in open space i always felt like he could have contributed way more than he did if we just used him and used him right um it's interesting to see i've been a very big fan of of tj yeldon of actually using him, and then every year last year when Paul and I would do our shows, and he was inactive for the game, and I go, well, it's going to be another week, apparently. So um, let me start with Jeremy, and I'll kick it over to Clayton. What do you think of, of the question by Stephen about talking about T.J. Yeldon? Um, I think it's just simply because uh, they just didn't want to bench Frank Gore. Uh, I, I don't think it had anything to do with that, and we also wanted to carry like seven safeties on the roster each week for special teams. <laughs> So that didn't really help. Plus the addition of Sonoris Perry and his special teams ace. I don't know if he made a tackle last year. But, you know, so you combine those things, and that's why we didn't use TJ Yeldon. But now we have, what, two extra roster spots per game day. Hopefully we're chimped down to five safeties a, a week. Yeah. And maybe Sonoris Perry is no longer on this roster. So TJ Yeldon should be on the field. And, I, and I'm with you. I don't understand why he was in there. There was games where we lined up and we threw the ball 40, 40 times, like in three games. Um, and in none of those games was he active. And we had Frank Gore out there spread out at receiver. We had Pat DeMarco split out. We had Devin Singletary, who's getting better at pass catching. But he, he was he was everything but natural yeah. at catching the football last year. So hopefully this year we come to our senses and we put T.J. Yeldon in the lineup. Well, well, they do still have their special teams running back with Taiwan Jones. Can't forget about that. Okay? But – yeah, I didn't understand it. I, I'm one of those people that were a huge proponent of playing T.J. Yeldon because you look at the games that he played in, you're talking about, I believe, the New England game, the Tennessee game. I understand he had one fumble against the Bengals and one fumble in preseason, but that doesn't necessarily mean he has a fumbling problem. I mean, people won't like it when I say it, but a player like Josh Allen has a fumbling problem. A player that fumbled twice in his some odd 20 carries or 20 touches, that's not necessarily a fumbling problem. That could be bad luck or a player or defense just making a good play. And you look at a player like T.J. Yeldon, the natural receiving back out of the backfield, he would have helped Josh Allen in his two stru- or, or two areas that he needed help the most, against man coverage and against blitz packages. Because you use a uh, receiver out of the backfield like that, teams are less likely to blitz you. They're, it's going to keep defenses honest. Yeah, I, I really didn't understand why they didn't use T.J. Yeldon. I hope they use him more this season. I mean, if they don't draft another receiving back or a more elusive back out of the backfield here in the draft, I could see it as as an option, but I definitely think they're going to address the position in the draft because Taiwan Jones, I mean, he might bring a little to the offense, but not nearly as much as they need to have a a, a good compliment to Devin Singletary. How dare you guys spit on the good name of Christian Wade? (laughs) 
2021. I had to bring it up. I had to bring it up because he is a popular name. His name's going to come up again once again in the preseason when he was playing against guys that are currently working in, in auto shops right now uh, for Carolina when he was making all those runs. Um, no, what I'm trying to say – so I got to – this is going to be kind of tough for me because I – 100% agree with both of you as far as TJ Elton goes. Like, if you tried to go into a 21 personnel set and you wanted to put Devin Singletary and um, and uh, TJ Elton in the game with with Dawson Knox as your 21 personnel, now when you flank him out wide, you gotta you gotta make a decision as a defense because you're in your base package because the Bills came out in 21 personnel. So you gotta sit there and go, listen, are, are we gonna are we gonna send a linebacker out there on TJ Elton who's six foot two by the way? He's one of your tallest receivers and he's <laughs> he's. He's a running back for crying out loud, um, and, and I totally agree with you, Clayton. As far as the fumbling problem, like I don't. I, okay, the guy fumbled a couple times. You know when he doesn't fumble when he's outside running routes. That's when he never fumbles when he has to go catch passes. I mean, two, two three years ago, uh, the guy had more receptions than Zay Jones for crying out loud, and and, <laughs> and yeah. that's that's when Zay was the leading yeah. wide receiver for the Buffalo Bills. You know I mean, what I mean? You're talking about splitting them out wide. Didn't they only do that once? And it was it was a horribly designed play. Tennessee. Horribly designed play. They did, they did it against the Titans, and they had uh, who, who's their middle linebacker? The Titans. Rashawn Evans. Evans. Oh, yeah. Yep. Yeah. They had him split out wide on T.J. Yeldon, and they he, Allen just dumped it and it hit the ground, and there was nothing to do. It was a third, I think it was third and six or something like that. Yeah, I didn't. I didn't like the the five wide sets that they ran, uh, and I understand why you run them. Is that you you come out in four wide set, and then you motion Yeldon outside, and you want to see if a linebacker goes with him. If a linebacker goes with him, then it's more than likely man. If if the zone if the zone corner just kicks out, then it's more than likely going to be zone. Um, but and and they can hide it all the time. Uh, the defenses can hide that all the time. However, if you have Yeldon out there, it's almost like he's a forgotten man. It's like they don't even cover the wide rec- the running back when he's out there. No one even covers him. You throw him a quick dart pass and you have the two wide receivers on his side go block out. He can cut it up inside and he can give you some positive yardage for you. But I don't I, like I don't understand why they don't use Yeldon more. It, just the idea of Yeldon. Now, do I think he's a legit RB two? That argument can be made by a lot of people. But as far as a receiving threat and a Brian Dable offense, when you run as much five white sets as you do, why not? Why not put the guy out there? I don't understand that. I just don't get yeah, it. I, I, I agree with you. Like I said, it, it, I touched on Clayton's point. Like, this is the guy that Allen really needed to help him. And they didn't even use him. It, it just didn't. It really made, it never, it really made no sense because when we brought him in, he was supposed to be an RB3, but our pads, our Receiving back because Singletary didn't catch how many balls did he catch in college? He only caught a few. Was 16. Was yeah, 16. like 16 balls through his whole entire college career. And Frank Gore's 36 years old. So I can't see you um saying, hey, we're gonna get up and use Frank Gore in a passing game today. But somehow <laughs> Brand Dable is able to do that. So I, you know, I, I think this year he probably has a spot on this roster. I, I really do, and I hope they learn from their mistakes. Yeah, he's a uh, you know, um Bean and McDermott have been very uh very conscious of the fact that guys that only have one year deal left and whether or not those guys are expendable. I mean, you got to remember, he was signed as an insurance policy a couple days before the draft, before they went and and drafted Devin Singletary, and they already had Gore and McCoy on the roster. So uh, it's going to be interesting to see what uh, what manifests with Yeldon, though. He's a very intriguing individual in this offseason. So Um, coming in uh, with the final question, Matthew Ronkowski, he said, which will will a player be traded slash cut based off best player available in the draft? All right, let me start with Clayton, and I'll kick it over to Jeremy for this one. This could be interesting. I mean, I believe this is position dependent more than anything, because if it's an edge rusher and they find a replacement for or an adequate replacement for, at that for Trent Murphy, then yes, I believe Trent Murphy is either going to get cut or traded because you look at that cap number, it just sticks out like a sore thumb with his production. I like what he did last season, but not for that cap number. And, you know, you look at, I know that in 2019, they had the most salary cap allocated to the defensive line. And you look at the additions they made like Vernon Butler and Quentin Jefferson. I don't, I don't think that changed. I don't think that changed at all. They have a lot of salary cap allocated to the defensive line. You added a player like Jefferson who kind of has that hybrid skill set along with Meyer Addison. So you have three defensive ends over the age of 30 and you have Daryl Johnson behind them, but you need to get a little younger at that position. I feel like if they draft a defensive end at 54, then uh, Trent Murphy's time is ticking. You know, I'm going to go, I'm going to go to the other side of the ball. I'm going to go if, put, um, Rob, talking about Mario's point earlier about the tackles possibly dropping this draft. If there's a tackle taken at 54, I think Ty Seki is, is out of here. I think he'll be trader cut. I mean, 
reality, he has a he's holding a five point two million dollars in savings right now, and just brought Daryl Williams in for a measly two point five mil. And obviously, we don't even know where Cody Ford is even playing yet, or what the plans are for it is. But if you bring another right tackle, I think Ty Zek is either. He's what thirty four years old. He's making a seven point seven million dollar cap hit this year. So I I see Zeki being the one being you know, shown the door. He was he, the first the first ability is availability, and he was not available last year almost at all. Okay, so all right, <laughs> so Clayton took defensive end, you took offensive tackle. Who the heck am I gonna pick? Like it's it's on the chopping block because the best player available. Well, I I think that um, it's interesting because we want we want to talk about the whole scope of the draft. It's like Voshan Joseph is an it's an extra draft pick for the Buffalo Bills this year. So you know you can't even say even if Kyle Duggar is available, I mean the Bills would be silly not to not to go with that pick, but it it, de- it offers another dimension to your to your offense. I mean guys. You guys are hitting. You guys are missing the most obvious point here. They're going to draft Trey White's replacement. I mean, what's wrong with you guys? At 54, they're going to take a corner that's going to replace Trey White because they're not going to be able to sign him. Now, um, I, I really, I see. Here's, here's, here's. I cannot offer a counterpoint to both of you guys because both of them make absolute 100% sense. The only thing I would change with with Clayton was uh, they. You signed Mario Addison is who is more of a. He plays more on the side of Jerry Hughes than he does on um, Trent Murphy, and like I like I said, man, Murphy is not a nine million dollar player right now. Like he's a great guy. He, he he sets the edge. He does a lot of little things for you on that side of the ball. However, at nine million dollars, you're gonna need more production out of that defensive end spot. So I could see them on the other side of the ball trading Hughes because you got Addison. Everyone thinks Addison is going to be the, the, the replacement for, for Murphy, but I think he's going to play on the other side with Hughes and rotate in there. So I, I it's just, I, I'm interested to see if, if Daryl Johnson put on 15 pounds in the off season, if he's able to set the edge on that side, because if he's able, if they're anywhere near like this, then it's going to be uh, Trent Murphy's going to be showing the door. Unfortunately, too, because I like Trent Murphy and what he's done for the Buffalo Bills and how he plays. He, he's just he's just not flashy. Like people people want flashy over on there on that defensive end side of the ball. So, uh, God, I can't think of one to, to to counter because you guys made two excellent points as far as Ty Nasecki and um, and Trent Murphy getting waived. I don't know, man. I can't think of one. I can't think of one. I would add a corner though. If like if I had my pick at fifty four, yeah. let's just let's just say this right at the end. Let's 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 close with this. Your ideal positional pick at fifty four. What do you guys got? Let's start with Jeremy and I go to Clayton. I'm going uh, wide receiver. Ooh, That's it. I, you know John Brown just, just turned thirty. Beasley's thirty. Um, I I think another receiver to be added between these veterans will help because like I said, you're still going to need number two, a new number two, probably within two years. And these guys have no guarantees left in their contract after this season. Yeah, that's true. So, I, I my ideal pick is wide receiver still. <laughs> Who you got, Clayton? Who's your ideal positional pick at uh, 54? I mean, I love a wide receiver, but I'm going to say running back because I feel like if you can get a dynamic back, like one of these three running backs like Jonathan Taylor or DeAndre Swift or J.K. Dobbins, if any of them start to fall out of the top ten picks of the second round, I wouldn't be shocked at all to see Brandon Bean move up and draft one of those running backs because you look at these running backs and their skill set and how they'd complement Devin Singletary to completely change the element of your backfield. You now have a player who can run between the tackles while also being able to run off the edge with Singletary. And then you have a dynamic threat. All three of those players would be dynamic threats in either the passing game or the running game. So I think that a player with that kind of element, with that kind of speed, the explosiveness that Singletary kind of lacks in a little, in a little way, I think that would add a completely different element to our running game. Guys, I just have to add, I just got to say this real quick. How good is this team and how stacked is this Buffalo Bills team when we're talking about Beasley, Brown, and Diggs as our wide receivers and Jeremy mentioning we might we might take a wide out at 54 and Clayton talking about we're at, with our second round pick getting a complimentary back to our already starter that we have. Like it's – you're talking about like bonus features for this team, like of things that you want. Oh, hey, you can take Kyle Duggar. Oh, you just got Hyde and Boyer back there. You know what I mean? It's like it's so interesting to see how stacked and how Brandon Bean and Sean McDermott have been able to stack this team up with the depth of talent that they have. That in the second round, your first pick, you're able to first of all trade away your first round pick, and now in the second round, you're able to go listen. 
Let's get a complimentary bag for Singletary. Eh, it's a toy. <laughs> let's go. Come on, let's get that. Hey, we need another wide out. You know, and, and to Jeremy's point, I understand that 100%. Brown's 30. Uh, they both, him and Beasley, both have two years left on their deal. Diggs has another four years. This is the time that you want to draft a, a top flight wide out in order to develop him in this Brian Dable offense, which is not an easy offense to learn. So if he's able to sit behind those guys, not being, not being a first round pick, because we know the pressure that comes with first round players. He's able to learn for maybe two years, the two years that Brown and Beasley are there, and then you put him on the opposite side of Stephon Diggs if he ends up to develop. I think I think that's that's dominant, but I just don't think in the second round that'll happen. I think that'll be a third round pick, okay. if anything. I think wide receiver will go in the third round. Me, I, I like the big uglies, man. Give me an offensive tackle at 54. Give me somebody to re- like like you to your point earlier, Jeremy. Give me somebody to replace Ty Naseki right now and slide forward to guard. Give me right this second. Give me some big, nasty, ugly guy that likes to just maul people on the right side of that line and can pr- protect Josh Allen, open up holes for Singletary, and do all that stuff. I, I am a big proponent of building your offensive line, and it, it seems like they've been uh, they've been very good at doing that uh, over the over the past th- two or three years. So, um, ladies and gentlemen, in the description of this video, you're going to see links to follow the Cold Front Report, both on their website, Facebook, and tw- and uh, both of their Twitter accounts, Jeremy and Clayton. Uh, they were they were uh, nice enough to devote their time today to uh, the rapid fire segment here on hashtag Sports Me.